Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Roger Burlton. Um, you probably saw me on the first, first we opened up being very embarrassed. Um, and so <laughs> today's going to be a little bit different. But what I'm going to talk about today is uh, business processes. And what we've heard year after year after year is, oh, business processes are good. They were good. We don't need them anymore. Now we're doing digital. Now we're doing something else. Now we're doing something else. Now we're doing capabilities. Now we're doing business architecture. But what, we're, what I'm really going to talk about is that you're not going to be able to kill the, your processes. They're there whether you like them or not. Your customers have processes hitting them whether you realize it or not. They're still processes. We still have to do work. And I think that's really one of the main distinctions I want to talk about in this is that, that if you're going to actually do real work, that means you're going to have to have real processes. And I think nobody would disagree with the fact that that work needs to be done by someone or something within your organization. And so therefore, how do you actually manage that? How do you optimize that? How do you make it the best it can possibly be? And so that's really what I want to talk about today is why it's so important and also how, uh, what, what are some of the techniques we can use to actually do better process work and design how we get things done inside organizations. So they're here to stay, whether you like it or not, um, and they're coming back strong. We really see that very interestingly that, that, um, that in, in, in all the training that we do around the world, we're getting a lot of people coming back to process training. A lot of people who are learning how to be A's, you've got to figure out how you analyze work, how you define what the work should be, how you specify what's automated and what's manual, and how all that stuff gets figured out in, in the optimum way. So what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about, a little bit about history, because we did get here from somewhere. And I'm going to talk about some of the use cases, some of the, the reasons why and how we use process management. I'm going to talk about where it's used for strategy, where it's used for architecture, how we need processes for design, how we op ex execute and operate processes every single day when we're doing the core work of the organization for our clients and our customers. I'm also going to talk about it from the point of view of governance. How do we actually govern end-to-end -end work to make sure we're optimizing all the time with regard to, to what takes sense, it makes sense. And so uh, then I'll talk a little bit about, just to summarize quickly, about how all this comes together and how we're still finding new ways to do new things that require you to understand what work gets done and how work gets done as we're going forward. So the first part of this is to basically say, I say it's not new, but we've been doing work forever. You go back to the revolutions. We had the agricultural age. People did work in the agricultural age. May, they may not have formalized and drawn process models uh, in, in the farming communities, but nonetheless, people did work. And the farmers knew what to do. They knew when to get up in the morning. They knew when the cows had to be fed and when the chickens had to be looked after and when the grain had to be brought in and what the best mechanisms were. And they had tools for doing that. And they had resources for doing it. So work was still being done. It may, may not have been formally articulated other than through um, through long history, best practices, all the things that people have learned over the years and that new people learned through apprenticeship and stuff like that. Then the Industrial Revolution came along um, and actually one, that was one time we started to formalize the work a lot more. Uh, so first of all, in factories and, and, and so on, uh, you, you see how work got done in, inside those industrial, uh, in those industrial um, plants and factories and so on. And you also saw, saw how the, cha the changing nature of work cha also changed society. Uh, people moved into cities from, from, from uh, basically um, urban, uh, from, uh, um, uh, rural areas, and they started to do the same job every day, year after year. Maybe even within a family, we had names of people, such as the, anybody here with the name Baker? Any Bakers in the room? OK. Uh, any Smiths in the room? I, I, I figured I'd catch it on the Smiths, okay? So, so basically, but you, what you see in those names is that the work that was done was done generation after generation after generation, and your name actually reflected what you did and the work that you performed. And so, uh, sorry about this, I'll just... Uh, <laughs> reminding me I have a race coming up next year. So anyway, so, but, but work had to be done in those factories as well. And then sort of we moved a bit more along in the Industrial Revolution days, and we started to see things like these call centers, which are very much an Industrial Revolution type of artifact that we're still doing, 
where basically we get people together, show them how to do things, respond to inquiries, and so on. And now we're sort of going into a new, a new age, which is this knowledge age. And of course, by the way, every one of these revolutions was painful because it was big change that had to happen. But we're now going through a new one. And it probably won't be any less painful to people in terms of their jobs and their roles and so on. And we're going to do work in a different way. But we're still getting things done. Even if we're using AI, even if we're using various other technologies, we're still getting work done. And our role as business analysts and architects and system designers is to make sure we can articulate what that work is so it can be done in the most optimal way. So, um, so what all I'm really saying here is work is not new, processes are not new, we still need to figure out the best way to do things in order to be able to, uh, to thrive the best way we can. So a little history on this is that this is the classic Gartner hype curve. Many of you must, may have seen this before. What it says is that you get a new idea and everybody gets all excited about it and everybody jumps on the bandwagon and they, they expect it's going to solve all their problems. And by the way, one of my rules is that anytime somebody says, we, I've got something that's going to solve all your problems, run away as fast as you can. <laughs> because there's never one thing that's going to solve everything. And so it's a complex set of things that, that, have, to, that have to be put into place. So we went through the Industrial Revolution, as I talked about. We went through quality management, things like Lean, Six Sigma, Deming, and, and all those types of situations. Um, and, then, and in 1990, in the, uh, the summer of 1990, Michael Hammer wrote a, a, landmark, a, 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 a groundbreaking sort of article with regard to business process reengineering. And everybody really jumped on process. They went absolutely crazy. And then when year 2000 came along, and some of you might, probably were working at that point in time, um, when year 2000 came along, a lot of people jumped on process because they realized they couldn't just change the software. And it was all about fixing the code. But a lot of people took that as an opportunity to actually change how work got done and, and, and actually buying new software to enable that work as opposed to take the risk of actually fixing what they had already because they didn't even know where all the dates were in the first place. And so um, th that came along. And then more recently, we've seen things like business process management systems, service-oriented architecture. And now the latest one of these is digital, right? So, but all of these are sort of leading to this, this peak of, is it called, the peak of inflated expectations. And then, but then pretty quickly, it drops off the other side, and everybody says, oh, no, that didn't work. We'll abandon that. We'll go to a, something else which is going through the peak of expectations. It's going to solve all of our problems. Um, but then if it has anything which is reasonable at all, it's going to come back. But it's going to come back more slowly, more gradually, but, but also more sustainably. And that's really, I think, what we're saying with this, ch this chart here, that, that you go through the depths, and then it gradually starts to come back. And we're seeing that right now with business processes. People are realizing it's fundamental. Whether you're doing, uh, whether you're doing business improvement, whether you're doing requirements, whether you're doing agile, whether you're doing architecture, um, you still actually have to define what you do in the organization, and then who's going to do that type of work. So, um, I think we're coming out of the other end of this now, and I think we're going to see it's going to be a very foundational skill for everybody in the organization. And so one of the things I, I might refer you to in all of this is um, a piece of work that was done a few years ago now, which is called the Business Process Manifesto. And it's a set of principles, a set of design, uh, design foundations that are used to basically determine what our business process is all about. And of course, the classic one in, in the Industrial Revolution was I take my raw materials, I do something to it, and out, out of the other end, I actually produce a finished good of some type. So um, we, have a, we, we work with a lot of organizations that do things like make chocolate bars. Well, if you go to one side of the factory, you see trucks lined up with liquid, cocoa, sorry, liquid sugar and cocoa. On the other side, you see pallets and trucks full of chocolate bars. You cannot reverse that process. It's a chemical change or that it's not going to be undoable. But that input process output is definitely there. But more and more, the inputs and the outputs are informational. But more importantly, the inputs are going to come from a, somebody in the outside world who has an expectation of a great result. And that great result is going to satisfy their needs. The outcome will satisfy their needs. So it's not business processes as, as we're defining them now 
are not just about transforming things, they're about satisfying expectations, satisfying need, getting delight, getting re repeat business, getting very satisfied customers on the other end. So all the stuff we're talking about today with regard to customer, 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 customer first, all those types of things are really incredibly important, but what it does, it demands processes to be working well also. Because if, you, if your customers are dissatisfied, it means you've got a broken process somewhere, at least one, but certainly the end-to-end -end from customer back to customer is not working. So there's something wrong in that flow. There's something that's not working out right. And as analysts, we have to be able to figure out where that is, what that is, how to fix it, and make sure we actually fix the right thing in the first place. And when we're redesigning the business, we better start to figure out who are the outsiders who, who really expect things from us so we can design it to actually meet their satisfaction and so on. So we would actually say here, just in terms of definition, an organization's business processes clearly describe the work performed by all resources. It doesn't matter if it's technology, it doesn't matter if it's uh, humans, it doesn't matter if it's a piece of equipment, it's all the work we do to create outcomes of value for customers and other stakeholders. This is really important. One of the things I think we have to watch out for as analysts is everyone's talking about customer, 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 customer satisfaction, customer requirements, customer delight, and customer journeys. Yeah, that's all good. But if you can meet all your customer requirements while you're failing all the regulatory requirements and you get shut down or you, you have massive fines or, or your reputation is, is uh, on the table because you're not actually complying with all the right things that have to be done, if you don't balance those two things off, you're going to be in trouble. And if you're doing all this while you're losing money, the owners aren't going to be very happy about that, the shareholders and so on. So the, the point here is that this is not just customers, it's balancing it with other stakeholders as well, including staff. When we basically do uh, process analysis, we always basically say at the architecture level, we say staff are one of the stakeholder types. Because if your staff aren't happy, Guess who's going to figure that out real, real fast? Like, have you ever been on the phone, you call the call center, and you realize you're talking to somebody who hates their job? Have you ever had that realization? How long did it take you to figure that out? It's not, it's not minutes. <laughs> it's seconds. So if your staff are not treated well, your customers won't be treated well, so you have to balance that off as well. So this is, uh, this, is, this is very different than the Industrial Revolution whereby you know, we actually had commodity workers who could be actually quite replaced. Now we require very knowledgeable people who have the right attitudes so it shows up across the board. But it's all your processes are going to ultimately connect to somebody on the outside world. That's really what this really says. By the way, if, if you're interested in that, um, there is uh, a, a good reference of, of the manifesto on the... Uh, BP Trends website, it's on the front page, bptrends.com, you can just find it, click on it and download it. Uh, it's available in 14 different languages now, um, so you can actually get, uh, get the one that's going to work for you, okay? Um, so now the other thing then, what we're really saying here is that our business processes, really all they do is they, they're sort of the place, like, like the octopus, they go out and grab all the different things and they can hold them all together. And they really do connect the dots. And they connect the dots. For example, here, I would say that your business strategy can be segmented down into specific processes, and your processes can actually help you implement your strategy. So it's, it's the best way to do it. And by the way, the org chart is probably the worst place to do it. Because the, the processes which cross the org chart and deliver value to the external, external world reg exist regardless of how you're formally structured. Those processes will always be there. If you ask the customer what the process is, they'll tell you. And they'll tell you what's working and what's not working. And, it's, and the process is not when something hits your, your department starting and leaving is the end of the process. So the start and end is from the stakeholder back to the stakeholder, not from the department to the department. And so quite often when we do this process work, we do it within the department, but maybe those departments are not the best way to do it. The definition of what the processes are will always be pretty stable, but your org chart is going to change much more often than your processes do. So basically, my business strategy will be implement, implemented by a set of processes in the middle of this diagram. 
then your products and services are delivered through your processes. You have to do things to deliver the product and the service, right? So quite often the, uh, the process is act actually is the service and sometimes it's just the output is, is a result of the, the processes that you've executed. Stakeholder experiences processes. When we talk now about experience management and journey mapping and, and moments of truth and things like that, we're actually talking about the experience that our customers have with the work that we do. And by the way, sometimes the best experience in the world is not to have one. And as uh, Roger Tregear, who's here this week, uh, often says that you really don't want to be known as the best airline in the world uh, dealing with lost luggage. I don't want that experience. So don't send me an email afterwards, after, we found, after you found my luggage, don't send me an email asking, what, asking me what my experience was like. I didn't want that experience at all. I don't care how good you are at it. So, but basically the stakeholder relationship is delivered through experiences and the experiences are delivered through the interaction with the processes that we have. It might be simpler, it might be very involved and so on. Um, business performance is measured by business processes. So a process can be measured as to how long does it take? How successful were, uh, were we? How many rejects and returns? How many complaints did we have? I can measure a process and I can connect those measures to the strategic measures of the organization. I can find traceability on measures if I've got a good process stack. Matter of fact, the process architecture, the layers going down, is, is actually going to give you the structure for your measurement system. You don't need a separate project to go out and do a separate performance management dashboard separate from your process architecture because that's going to give you your leading indicators on the smaller pieces as opposed to just catching the lagging indicators at the end when it's too late to do anything about it. So that's going to be helpful too. Um, information, everybody's talking now about data, data, data. Hey, guess where your data gets created? You have to do work to create that data. And so by the way, if you've got a data quality problem, then you've got a business process problem. So we see lots of people doing data quality issues right now, but, but basically that information is created by a process. It might be then used in another process, and if it's poor quality, it's gonna mess that process up, which is gonna create even more bad data uh, going forward. So input process output these days is data oriented. Um, now a lot of people are talking about capabilities these days, especially the, the business architects are talking about capabilities. So, um, it's, that's wonderful, but, but if I don't actually use the capabilities to do something, I've got a capability which is not helping me at all. So it's nice to know I need, um, I need an identity management capability in my organization so I know who you are when you come in and, and so on. That's great. But if I never have a process to identify you, I don't need that capability. So capabilities are only useful and can only be, be evaluated when they're used when they're used to actually accomplish something. Now clearly, we can have processes that have multiple capabilities, and we can have capabilities that are used to support multiple processes, that's what we want. Um, but capabilities do, should not exist alone. So if you're, doing, and if you're doing business architecture or enterprise architecture, and you're doing capabilities without processes, you're missing something. By the way, that could be termed, uh, used in terms of value streams or value stream stages, if they're still processes, and so on. Um, if we want to basically look at our change portfolio, what are all the things we need to change? Well, because processes are connected to performance results, I should be basically prioritizing things which are, which are bad performers, so I can use the process measures to actually help me evaluate what things I need to prioritize and what things I need to change. And not just a list that comes up once a year from all the departments and all the department managers who come in and say, ah, these are all the things I'd like to do this year. And they're all coming up from the bottom by department, by department, by department. And what you end up with is like five projects hitting the same type of thing which are uncoordinated, or no projects hitting something which really should be done across the board, but no individual manager is accountable for that. So you can't pitch these things. This is a major, major change in, in process thinking. And if you do that, then you'll also find out which capabilities are used for those priority processes and what things I should be making change happen on. So I think it's a fundamental change in, with regard to that. Also, the business processes will, basi that, that will basically allow us to put, put in place the appropriate end-to-end -end governance. So we, we often hear about process owners, process executives, things such as that. 
Well, they need to have, uh, have the processes well defined so they know what they're accountable for. They know what they're advocating for. They know what they're trying to recommend with regard to change uh, going forward. And of course, the, the classic one, the traditional one, is in the bottom right corner. It's all about continuous improvement once we've got something in. So we can have to make the decision, is there major change on these processes, or are they just, do we continue to improve what we've got in place? All of this takes place. And, and the bottom of all that, and something else to think about, a lot of people in this conference are talking about business decisions. Well, guess where the decisions are made? Like, approve client, approve customer, approve order. Okay, approve order is actually a process. In it, it's, it's a, essentially a decision-making process and so that decision is made in the process. And what we're seeing is, I did a, 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 a little bit of research of my own. I went through the APQ, APQC, uh, um, basically, process classification framework, which is like 1,600 processes at four levels deep, um, which allows you to say, as a general business, do I have everything covered in my, in my models? So I went through that and basically looked at how many processes were actually making decisions and how many processes were actually doing something else. And I found about, is about 25% of the processes in, in the framework were actually now decision-making processes. An approval, a rejection, uh, an authorization, that type of thing, those types of processes. But I also found a, a pretty close to the same number, the 22, 23% of the processes there were to generate the information to be able to make the decision which was in the next one. So we're a lot about information to make decisions, to know where to go, um, and so that's sort of coming very, very strongly into our processes right now. Of course, business rules, business rules are used in processes, and you know, the, you know the rule for that, and the rule for that is we never embed them in the process. What we do is we leave them outside and we look them up when we go to execute. So that way we stay more flexible going forward. So I, I see uh, business processes as being in the hub of a lot of things that we're doing today. And that's why I say they connect the dots. These are all the other dots around the outside. and We can bring them all together into, into one vehicle. It's the best way to sort of connect everything else, the best way to sort of uh, to be able to handle that going forward. So let's have a look at a few reasons why we might want to do this. So strategy and architecture. So the first thing we want to do, is, and referred to this already, is that if you look at the outside world, we have a bunch of different stakeholders. I've got customers and regulators and suppliers, staff, owners, and so on in this particular example. But when the customer basically sends in um, an order request, something comes into the organization and it magically navigates all over the place. Um, and it might even go outside and come back again out to a supplier, for example, a partner. But it's not done until it comes back. So if this is an org chart in the white boxes underneath it, the actual process is the red dotted line going across them. And of course, the, if we do this right, we turn that order request into a product and an invoice, and ultimately we get paid, and then the process is done when we get paid. So we, we make sure we have integrity going across all of this. And I could draw that org chart 25 different ways, but the red line is the same red line. Right? And so we have to basically make sure we are able to handle all that. So our product services information are very much connected to the, connecting the inside world to the outside world according to the expectations of the people on the outside world. By the way, I really do have to apologize that this is just pure common sense. And so, <laughs> I mean, uh, it's really interesting that we have to explain common sense sometimes to our executives um, because it... Maybe it's not common. Common sense isn't so common after all, right? That type of thing. But it's hard to argue with some of the things we're talking about here. And so the other thing we start to see, if you want to get into architecture, this is the highest level process architecture you can possibly find. So basically, this is some, some um, uh, restaurant situation where we have restaurant dining, banquet services, and pizza delivery, right? Those are the three major lines of business that we have. Those are really super duper high level processes. Within each one of those, there's a bunch of sub-processes. Within each one of those, it's going, it's going, and going. Or you could say value streams, value stream stages, if you wish. And then on top of that, I have, I have processes that actually help me guide the business or manage the business, developing plans, establishing policies, uh, budgeting and controlling finances. That should be used across all lines of business. And other things such as provide employees, facilities, IT, sitting on the bottom, that enables. So the top guides what you're going to do, and the bottom gives you the resources to be able to do the work. Highest level process you can find. It basically, it's like, I'm from Canada, so it's a kilometer wide, centimeter deep, 
or if you're from, um, from uh, the US, of course, it's mile wide, inch deep. But it's not, it's not a mile deep at this point in time. So you want to break, basically bring it, bring it down a layer at a time where we continue to create value. Um, another thing we can find in the, all this is that this is not actually drawn as a, as a journey map, but a journey map essentially is going to define the, the major touch points. And in between the touch points, you have processes. And that's really all this says. So the left-hand column basically says, how does, the, how does the customer see this? They recognize the restaurant. They search for options and so on, request the order, search for the status, accept the food, and evaluate the relationship, right? That happens every time you have a transaction. And on the bottom one, we have, you may reassess and terminate the relationship by saying, I'll never do this again with you, right? That type of thing. Notice that then, then in the middle is what we do. Uh, so, so in all of that, these are become our processes to respond to the customer journey, where we would get to things like accept the order, prepare the food, um, deliver it, evaluate the customer relationship. And also we terminate, we might terminate the customer relationship as well. But notice it does not say terminate customer. Okay, we're actually terminating the relationship, we're not actually terminating customers. Unless that is your business, of course. <laughs> but uh, I know it's tempting, it's very tempting. Then on the right hand side, we can see all the states we reach. So because of all this, what we do is we actually take stakeholders through a journey from unawareness to awareness to informed to when we have orders accepted, the food is prepared. You see the closing condition on the process. We also see what we've delivered of value to the customer. So I quite like this. What we're really doing is taking the left-hand side, and your okay, left-hand side, and what we're really doing with that is we're figuring out what do we do to achieve the other side. And so um, the processes are actually very, very strongly connected to value creation for people who care about what we're trying to accomplish. So, um, and if you are doing value stream mapping in, in business architecture, you're actually trying to figure out uh, information flow, then you are going to have to sort of sort this out. And by the way, if this is going digital, this is a really good point. If this is going digital, what you are digitalizing is the middle column and the left-hand column. Traditional automation might only deal with the middle and the left hand interacts with it. But if you own digital and you're putting that, that capacity into people's hands through an app, then you've got to deal with their process, not just your process. As a matter of fact, you might want to think about it as that we're not really developing processes. We're, all we're really doing is we're actually helping customers with their process as opposed to having our process. So it's a different way to think about it. So I'm going to have to make sure they can order through the app. I'm going to have to make sure we can deal with an order when we get it. And the, the data flow goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So even though the process is incredibly important here, the data is also unbelievably important. Because if I don't get the right data management early in the game, I might have to go back and ask for the same data five times. I want it once as soon as it happens, I want it as soon as it comes in. So digitalization absolutely requires you to figure out what the workflow is across those processes. Um, one of the things we use is we use this approach we call an IGO, which means input, guide, output, enabler. And so what we do with regard to all of this is the business information we need, we look at it not only from a BPMN point of view, and this is a, an important point for me. BPMN is really, really awful at dealing with data. BPMN was not designed to deal with data. BPMN was, de was designed to deal with sequencing and flow of work, but not the data flow. So if you're going much more into uh, data management now, you are going to have to figure out what information comes in, what information goes out, and what information is referred to but not updated in the process. So in this particular example, if we go back to my restaurant, the an example of reference data, which is guiding you but not being transformed, would be things like the delivery menu. The process of taking an order does not update the delivery menu, but the process of taking an order requires you to know what's on the delivery menu in order to accept the order. So we actually separate those three things out. Now you have to be careful of certain types of processes that may not make any sense. So for example, if you see information coming in, but nothing comes out, we call that the Hotel California process. If you know the song, right? You can, 
you can check out any time you like, but you can never leave, I think is the line that's important. And we also have things like nothing comes in, but something comes out. We call that the God process. Okay, we create things out of, the, out of nothing. So you have to watch out for certain types of things, and you, see you find certain patterns where the information and the process actually connects together. So this is a really good way to connect processes and, uh, and data. You see the actions that the process takes on the data. And if you have a data quality problem coming out, you have to ask the question, why is that? Are we creating a mess inside the process? Or are we sourcing poor quality information coming into the process? So watch out for some of those types of things, but we can connect this, this stuff up. And just for the business architects in the room, um, basically we have this issue of capabilities. Um, there's a lot of discussion historically about, and people would say things like, well, capability will define what processes you need in order to satisfy the capability. And, uh, and other people would say, no, 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 no. We have to have our processes so we knew what, know what capabilities we need for that process. And what we've discovered um, is that actually these are two independent variables and they associate together. So in this particular example here, if you look at the bottom of the capability stack, you see, uh, you see capability A.A.A. .A .A. That level three capability is used by process number 1.1.3, right? But, um, so, so that's gonna be important. But 1.1.3 also needs another capability called A.A.B. And so it's needed for both of those, for, for, it needs both of those capabilities. But A.A.B is also used in a different process called 1.1.2. So the point being here is a, any particular process needs multiple capabilities to be, in order to be able to execute properly. But every single capability can be used in more than one place. And that's really what we want. We can use our processes to make sure we know where, what the requirements are. So if I'm doing a requirement, if I'm doing a requirement for process 1.1.3, uh, I've got to go look at both of those other capabilities and make sure I can define them. But as soon as I do that, I've got to also look at the other processes that use that same capability so I can define it to be used in multiple places. What we're trying to do here is basically say the capability should be built once and shared often, but the processes could be unique, but they're going to be enabled by multiple capabilities. It's a many-to-many -many relationship. And you can blow away this argument that you get quite often in, with enterprise architecture groups versus process groups, arguing over which one is first. They're both important. They both have to work together. One does not work without the other. So hopefully we put that argument out of the way. And by the way, it's a new white paper coming out very, very soon for Business Architecture Guild that we've just been working on, which describes how these things are in common. And it's taken three years to get, basically to get four pages written but, but I, think that, um, I think the political aspect of that has sort of gone away, okay, hopefully. Um, so, if you do want to talk about uh, capability resources, we always use the, this hexagon that I developed a number of years ago, where basically it says, we focus on performance, we look at the processes and information around the outside of it, we ask questions about the organization, we ask questions about the policy, because you can actually have a process which is, from a workflow point of view, is perfectly good but it doesn't work because it's constrained by rules that make no sense. I'm sure that your organizations don't have any rules that don't make any sense, right? And so, you know, the, it's, it's a bit of a challenge, and what you might find is the way to improve a capability is to, is to change a rule. Then when that capability is used in the process, the process performs better. So, um, but there's other things as well, of course, technology, people, and uh, facilities and equipment, depending upon your business. And, don't ignore that little ring that goes around them right next to performance. It's called culture. I could be perfect on everything around the outside, absolutely perfect, but it still fails. Why? Because the behavior, and behavior of people and the culture of the organization is preventing us from making that type of change. So if you're doing process work, you have to ask the question, if I change this process, do I have to deal with the culture and the behavior and the acceptance of people? And that needs to be on the table as well. So process is actually helping us to coordinate and synchronize a lot of this stuff as we go forward. Um, another aspect of this is measurement. So I said before, processes can be measured. Uh, but I can measure how effective are we? Are we doing the right things for customers? I can measure how efficient are we? How well do we use our resources? I can measure the quality of things um, that, that basically say, do I have consistency of outputs given the same inputs? Um, 
And just a little, little story about that. My, my, my daughter now lives in Australia. She, was, she, she came home last year uh, with, with, with the, uh, the, the two kids. And she got home and somebody said to her, oh, you've been away five years now. Did you get your return visa? She said, yeah, but I'm sort of like a landed immigrant. I'm, I'm official in Australia. She said, no, no, no. If after five years, you have to get a return visa. And she said, I didn't know about this. So she phoned, the, she phoned back into Australia, uh, which, of course, they're only open in their working hours, which is like middle of the night for us. So she phoned back, talked to somebody on the phone, and they said, yes, that's right. You have to have all these documents, and you have to submit them, and they have to be the original copies, and you can't send photocopies, you, you, and you cannot do this online. You have to send it all in. And she said, but they're in my house in Sydney. So how do I get those? I said, well, you're going to have to get them somehow. So here she is with two kids, got a job back home. Her husband's on the plane coming over to meet up. There's no possible way she can get this. She's freaking out, okay? And so, so she just gave it a rest for a day. And then the next morning, she said, I'm going to call them back. She called back, talked to a different person. And the person said, no problem, ma'am. I can fix it for you right now. You know what? You've all done that. <laughs> when you don't like what you're hearing, you call back and hope to get someone different. That's a quality problem. I'm not saying what it should have been or should not have been, but you don't have consistency of results given the same types of things, and it to totally depends upon the individual you're talking to as to whether they have a process which is consistent or not. Okay, look for that. And agility. How how, how can I how can I handle an exception? And so, if, if I do straight through processing, it takes like like five seconds. But if I have to go to manual intervention, it takes three weeks. You know, can I, can I get more flexibility because there's a slight exception that's really taking place? So look to measure all of these factors, but they're all process measures. They're all measures that happen uh, uh, based upon what the process is. So, uh, of course, this, this goes in the, the whole stack of measurement. The lower level measures support the higher level measures, support the next one, but it's exactly the same structure as the process decomposition, which allow you to put your measurement system in place. And the other aspect here is that I can also look at, do I have business processes which allow me to prioritize? I can prioritize what's working well to the right of the diagram. I can prioritize what's not working well to the left of the diagram. I can also prioritize, um, sorry, that, that's up and down. Working well means, working well is the bottom row, working poorly is the top row. Strategically important is the right-hand side, and strategically unimportant is on the left-hand side. What, what do I want to work on? I want to prioritize processes which are strategically the most value-added thing we have and are working the worst. And then I get, more, I get more, for my, uh, more bang for my buck. As opposed to, as I said before, everybody pitches what they want. Okay? So, um, so this can help us in prioritization as well. The process structure can be really quite good for that. So uh, that's sort of the overall governance uh, ma management aspect. But I can also basically model these processes in, in different ways. I can, as I said already, I can model the bot in the look at the bottom left corner. That's very much the traditional swim lane diagram, BPMN simple version. Or in the other, the bottom right corner, I can do more of a data flow. Where I can actually show the data flowing, because in BPMN the lines are not data items; they're just de they're just sequencing and dependencies that work forward. So depending on what you're working on, you might take one or one or another of those uh, those those structures. Pretty classic uh, business processes define the operational workflow and also define the helps you define the roles that are required so you can define the responsibilities and what the jobs are and what need, that need to be done. This is pretty classic stuff, pretty straightforward. Um, I think we all sort of can learn this pretty quickly, right? We've all, a lot of us, as, if you're BA, you, you, you certainly must know how to do this kind of diagram. It's going to be necessary. But you could look at the workflow. By the way, notice it says this chart represents represents the analyst view. Don't ever show this to your executives. <laughs> because they, they're going to freak out. But someone needs to trace the data as to where it's created, where it's used, where it's updated. And if I have a problem on the bottom right corner, I got to keep going upstream until I find what's causing that problem. And I can deal with my, deal with my data issues at the same time. So it's your choice which way you want to go. It depends what you're working on. Sometimes I've seen organizations do both versions, a simple one to actually show people how the flow works, and another one much more for the analytical view to say, how can I trace data usage, data creation, a data traceability. Is, by the way, the data traceability is becoming an important regulatory issue if you're in financial services. You have to be able to show how the data was traced and where it came from in the first place. There's a lot of sort of GDPR and things like that are requiring 
uh, that type of traceability. Um, another thing, as I said, I said before, you can actually put decisions in your process. So the, how do your decisions get defined? The first one is, for, here's an example here, can we accept the customer's order? Well, is the delivery address in the, home, in the home zone? Is the customer able to pay? Is the order for items on the delivery menu? These are all questions that you can ask, which are decisions. And last one, is the customer acceptable? Okay, what do we mean by acceptable? Here it's, uh, has the customer returned too many orders? Is the customer abusive? Does the customer have a history of failed payments? And so these are all the questions. But then on the bottom is the, some of the rules. The delivery address must be inside a delivery zone. So I'm, I'm associating rules to decisions, to, and I can associate each one of these sub-decisions with a sub-process and build my process around my decision making. It's a really, really nice way to pull these things together as well. So um, the business process is going to be essential for this. And ultimately, the business process can also be, at the lower level of detail, can be the, can be the structuring of your requirements. And you can basically start to, as you get down the stack here, you start to write use cases for the, the, what the technology will have to do to support you. So the process still gives you a good structure, and you can use it all the way through to, do, to really manage your requirements definition that you have to basically provide to, to, to technology development. So there's a bunch of things we can do with that. Um, management and operate management, um, basically operations and improvement. Um, the, you know, I, once you get down to the detailed operation, I showed you the, the, the hierarchy of process of, of KPIs. Well, once you start to put that in operationally, you can actually track that, that information, provide it back to the operational managers so they can be determining what's working well, what's not working well every single day. So everyone's talking about data and analytics right now. Um, that's important, but if you don't have a place to actually hang your data, you really won't know where to look with regard to what's working well and what's not working well. The process should uh, enable us to do that type of thing. And, oh, I talked about this. <laughs> it's another diagram you don't show to your executives. But basically what it's saying here is, if I find problems in the bottom right, I go, I go to the previous one and say, did it come from here? Did it come from here? Did it come from there? Until I find, up in the top left where it says take order, if I have greens coming in from the customer, and then I have reds coming out from take order. What's coming out of take order is messing up prepare food, schedule delivery, and deliver orders. Messing up all of that because I didn't get it right at the beginning. Now I know how to fix my data problem because I can see where it, got, where it was sourced. I can see where it was created in the first place. So again, an, an, another tool that we can use to basically swim upstream. Just basically keep looking for where did this come from? Where did it come from? Green's coming in, red's going out. That's what you want to look for. And you can annotate your, your diagrams for this. You, you could do some of this on a BPMN diagram too. You can still annotate the BPMN diagram with these types of assessments also. Um, so for governance, let's look at the last part of this. We actually have a, an overall framework for this which basically says, I start by understanding what the business is all about, stakeholders, um, North Star, strategic intent, um, I can look at designing the business, which is information, processes, capabilities, and measurement. That's sort of the heart of a business architecture. I can then look at how do I build out the changes according to priority, and then I can go in to operate the business, and we live happily ever after uh, if we get down to that point, right? Hopefully. But all of this is iterating and cycling all the time. But you need to have some governance over this that determines who's going to take responsibility for actually the architecture as well as the implementation as well as the execution and operation. You need some governance over all that if you want to be mature. And the more mature you are, the more you'll have that. And uh, again, I'm not going to go into the details of this model, but this is one organization's model where we have executive process owners, we have process stewards that some people call process owners, uh, we have experts, and we have architecture and business process management teams supporting those people. But basically, we have responsibility for the ongoing results of that particular process in in operation, and when it's not working well, we cycle back and say we need to make changes, but there's somebody in the business responsible for monitoring that and making sure that's working okay. And so a lot of people are putting in gov governance over process performance, and if, you, if you're doing a lot of customer-centric type of work, you're gonna have to have someone responsible for making sure the end-to-end -end is working well, um, and as opposed to just hoping everybody collaborates and cooperates. You need some, some way to look at all of that. So, the challenge with this is, I've just scratched the surface. I've only just scratched the surface. 
there's so much more that we have to think about. And I'm going to throw this on this page. What about personas? So I can write personas, and I can test my process with the various personas. I can basically have them associated with the personas. I can have stories, and I can use that to evaluate, does this process work for, for, for this situation, that situation, other, other variations of all of this? I can write my journey maps. My journey maps are really, really helpful to make sure my processes take you from a moment of truth to a moment of truth and cuts out all the stuff in the middle that you really don't need um, like uh, what I mean by moment of truth, by the way, is, is that's what the customer really values. So we've done a lot of work in the, mor in the mortgage business, and the customer only values two points in the entire thing. One of them is, am I approved for the mortgage? That is the decision. Because as soon as you get the decision, and you know how much you qualify for, you know what kind of house you can buy, what kind of property you can step up to, and what kind of commitments you can make to actually do the deal, right? Really, really important. The longer you take to get to that, the more dissatisfied customers are. The second one is, did my money show up in my bank account when I went to close the deal? Right? Because then I can actually get the keys, I can get into the property. That's what I mean by moments of truth. So we, what you want to do is optimize from the point the application came in to the decision, and the other one is from the decision to the point you actually say, yeah, good, here's your money, good luck, enjoy your life, that type of thing. But, but what you see in the mortgage business, there's so many other touch points, and the customer says, I don't understand why I have to do all these other things. It's like my, my youngest daughter, is millennial, she said, Dad, I don't understand why I can't do my mortgage on my iPhone. Why do I have to talk to anybody? <laughs> and I'm sure that a lot of us can relate to the same type of thing when you have to go into a bank branch which is closed most of the time you're, you know, you're not you're not working. So that's another thing. Digital solution, digital apps, you have to follow the data, the process creates that data. If you're doing analytics, you have to have know where you're going to trace it back to. Uh, and the whole customer experience is very much about interacting with our processes, whether they be automated or whether they be uh, human-centric. On the right-hand side of this, we're seeing a whole bunch of new techniques popping up, or at least ones becoming popular. Process mining is becoming quite popular. But there's actually tools we can go in and it actually shows how people actually did follow the process, what stages they followed, what steps they followed, which ones they didn't follow. And, uh, and so you can actually see how people actually used, how, how they actually used the process. Robotic process automation, RPA. You know what you're doing? You have to write processes for those robots. You have to write very specific processes for those robots to be able to take information from here and put it over there because you developed two different systems 20 years ago, which you never would have done today. And so you wouldn't need a robot if you de developed it properly because you'd have one database, not two. Right? I'm being a bit facetious there. Anyway, um, but things like ser services, microservices, APIs, all require you to know what you're going to do. Business process management systems, automating the flow. Um, and things like compliance. The first thing the auditors ask for, if you've ever been in this situation, the first thing they ask for is, can, do you have any process maps? You seen that? Do you have any process map? And they go start and they start to look for risks and they look for control points and you should have modeled those and built them so built that in right from the beginning. And, uh, and also, if you want if you want an agile business, you you have to know which pieces I, you can change separate from everything else. So there's a lot. This and I haven't even talked about these things, right? So there's a lot of things here. So what I'm saying what I'm saying to you is, please, please, please get your process architecture figured out. When you do process work, work within the scope of the architecture and make sure that when you finish that work, you, put them, you update the models and put them back in. And by the way, if you're doing an agile project, update your process models and put them back. It's not an absence of documentation. You need that knowledge to be able to know, if I go to change it next year, what did I do and where is it? And what's the impact of the change I want to make at that point in time? Right. So all of that needs to be there. So, um, right. So I think you are here. This is where I started out. We, I basically think you are here. You're at the beginning of this slope coming back up again. I think they're not going away. It's going to be good for your career. You're going to need this knowledge anyway. And I think it's foundational. I don't think it's a specialization as much as it is foundational for everybody to be able to handle all this type of stuff. Closing slide here. Um, I'm not being overly prescriptive, but basically it says here, a lot of people say, well, well uh, I, I I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be prescribed and all this stuff. But you can have something we call freedom within a framework. 
A business processes are your framework. You can be very creative within it. And I love this quote. It says, this is actually a 1935 quote. It says, true freedom is not the absence of structure, that is letting employees go off and do whatever they want, but rather a clear structure that enables people to work within established boundaries in an autonomous and creative way. I really think that's what your process architecture and your structure is going to do. Okay. Now, quest give, me, give me a couple of questions. I have time for a couple of questions. What do you think? Am I crazy? I mean, that's a, so it might be a personal question. I don't know. Um, does, is this making sense to you? I, I, think this is, I think this is foundational. A question. Anyone? A question, please? No? No, if not, okay. I'm around off of the rest of the conference as well. I'm going to do a talk after lunch, which is going to be a really, really crazy talk about processes completely gone wrong, and it's going to be a really funny example. It wasn't funny when it happened to me at the time, but it's funny now. Anyway, uh, thank you very much, and thanks for coming.